the, the text and we'll bring those into the, the panel discussion in half an hour. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our next keynote uh, speaker, Professor Pablo Garcia Pavia leads a, a very large inherited cardiac disease and heart failure unit in Madrid and is going to talk us through the novel treatment options in amyloidosis. So thank you very much indeed. Pleasure to thank see you. you. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm delighted to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is novel treatment options in amyloid and particularly in DTR transthyretin in amyloidosis. And this is also a fascinating field that has changed dramatically over the last two, three years that we have seen a, a huge change in what we can offer to our patients. These are my discussers. Well, when we approach a patient with TTR cardiac amyloidosis, we have to think about two areas of treatment. One is supportive therapy, the management of complications, including atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death, conduction disorders, heart failure, and also specific treatments. And it's here in the specific treatments where we have witnessed an amazing revolution over the last two, three years, as, as, as I just previously said. Because, and this has changed so quickly that we can, the, the other day I was realizing this review that I wrote uh, 10 years ago. And in this review, when talking about a specific treatment in hereditary TTR amyloidosis or wild type TTR amyloidosis, we found out that 10 years ago, the only option that we had for some hereditary TTR patients was liver transplantation. For the majority of patients with hereditary TTR amyloidosis, no specific treatment was available. As it happens also with patients with senile or wild type TTR amyloidosis. Thanks God, this has changed. And it has changed because the understanding of the cascade process of amyloidogenesis has revolutionized this field. Now we know how amyloid fibrils get deposited at half level what is the cascade of the process of fibril formation. And by that, we know that there are certain places where we can intervene, we can try to stop this process. The first one will be to suppress the synthesis of transthyretin. The second place where we can intervene is try to stabilize the TTR molecule in order to prevent dissociation because it's this dissociation that creates monomers that eventually will form the amyloid fibrils. And the next frontier is this one. Try to remove the amyloid that has been deposited at heart level. Well, there is, as you can see here in this slide, there is a very large number of different compounds, different drugs, that are being developed or have been pro developed in order to tackle the disease at these three stages, three places. So I'm going to try to review these three stages where we can try to alter the TTR cascade. And the first one obviously will be stabilizing transthyretin. And for that, we already have one compound that has proven to be effective in a randomized control trial, and that is tafamidis. Probably you are all aware about tafamidis because the trial was published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And to me, this has been a landmark study, not only because it was the first effective drug for cardiac TTR amyloidosis, but also because it was the first effective drug for HEFPEF. Not only it was the first effective drug to treat heart failure at the central level, all the previous treatments that we had, neurohormonal treatments, acted at neurohormonal level and not at cardiac level. So this was the first drug to show effectivity 
in treating the cardiac organ. So what was a track study? This was a 441 randomized trial involving individuals with either wild-type TTR amyloidosis or hereditary TTR amyloidosis. Subjects were randomized two to one to receive tafamidis or placebo. And the primary endpoint was an all-cause mortality plus cardiovascular hospitalizations. Probably you are aware of the results of the data because they were really impressive. There was the, the, the group of patients treated with tafamidis showed a 30% relative risk reduction in mortality. That is a number needed to treat of only eight. And regarding cardiovascular related hospitalization, there was a reduction in the tafamidis treated group of a 32%. But probably you were already aware of this data. Is there anything new from the track in all over these years? Because this was published two and a half years ago. Yes. Now we know from analyzing the data of the trial that treating these patients early is very important because the earlier we treat the patients, the better results we get. And you can see here what were the reduction in the risk of death according to baseline NYHA class. And as you can see here, the reduction in death was much higher in individuals who were in functional class one or two than those who were in functional class three. Moreover, if the patients are able to walk more meters, that means in six minute walking test, they have better prognosis. And you can see here the mortality reduction in patients who could walk more than, as you can see here, 400, uh, this is not mortality reduction, sorry, this is the percentage of patients who died in the study according to the functional class as assessed by the number of meters that they could walk in the six minute walking test. And you can see here that the patients that do better are the patients who die less. We also have data from the extension study now. And now we see that the continued benefit in patients treated with tafamidis is prolonged over the duration of the open label extension study. And you can see here how with only six more months of follow-up, there was an increased reduction of 36% in all cause mortality. The other question that I get every time I talk about tafamidis is what is the optimal dose? Because in the trial, a dose of 80 milligram was tested and also a dose of 20 milligram in 20% of individuals. So now we have data of the, of the higher dose compared with the lower dose. Because in the trial, the trial was not designed to see differences in these two groups. But nevertheless, we had some clues of favoring the higher dose. And as you can see here, the reduction in the increase in anti pro BMP was larger in the individuals who received the higher dose of 80 milligram, which corresponds to the dose of 61 milligrams that was approved by the EMA and the FDA. Also in the track study at 30 months, we saw that individuals who received the higher dose had a larger proportion that did not increase anti pro BMP or even reduce, that was 45% of those receiving 80 milligrams. In contrast, 23% of individuals receiving 20 milligrams at 30 months showed a reduction or an stabilization of anti pro BMP values. Now that we have the long term extension study, we have been able to compare what happened to the individuals who were treated with the lower dose compared with the higher dose, with longer follow-up. And with, by doing that, we have recently published data showing that the higher dose is much better also in survival compared with the 20 milligram dose. 
What other stabilizers do we have? Well, one is diflunisal. Diflunisal is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that I don't know if it's available in the UK or not, but at least I know that patients with TTR amyloidosis get treated with diflunisal, maybe uh, obtaining them from the US or Canada where it is marketed. Well, diflunisal structure is pretty similar to tafamidis. And it was tested in a phase three trial with patients with hereditary TTR and polyneuropathy. And it was effective in treating polyneuropathy, although no changes in left ventricular hypertrophy or strain parameters was seen at heart level in the patients included in this trial. There are limited data analyzing diflunisat at heart level. And obviously, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug is something that you might not want to use in somebody who has overt heart failure and also is taking anticoagulants. But the data that we have, the limited retrospective data that we have from large centers who have been using it, like this data from Boston University, showed obviously uh, with all the bias of using it without randomization, quite nice results, uh, quite nice results in patients treated with diflunisol. Nevertheless, I want to point out that a large proportion of individuals who were treated with diflunisol, who received diflunisol, require, require discontinuation. To try to solve this, to overcome these problems, we have another stabilizer that is being developed currently, which is acoramidis. Acoramidis, formerly known as AG10, completed a phase two trial that was published in JAK one and a half years ago. And the phase three trial is currently ongoing. These are the results from the phase two trial with AG10 with acoramidis. And you can see that the population is pretty similar to the population that was included in the track study, with 30% of individuals with hereditary TTR being included in this small trial of 50 individuals. In this trial, it was shown that the patients had an increase in the levels of TTR in serum, which is what we want, because we are giving an stabilizer that prevents degradation of transtyretin. After this one month trial, individuals have been receiving this drug already for three years, and the profile of side effects is very good with no signals of an important adverse events. So this has led to the phase three trial, which is currently ongoing, which is the attribute cardiomyopathy trial. This is a 600 individuals trial that are gonna be, are, have been randomized two to one to receive a coramidis 80 milligram twice a day or placebo. We'll have the 12 months primary endpoint at the, in September this year. And we will have to wait a couple of more years in order to have the results of the 30 month trial. But obviously it's very good news that we have more options to treat these patients and more stabilizers. What is the second place or the second stage where we can interfere in the cascade of TTR amyloid formation. Here we have the TTR production. And here we already had from more than 30 years, liver transplantation. And we knew that liver transplantation was okay for patients with v certain variants, particularly the V30 met early onset variants but was not very good alternative in patients with other mutations like alanine 60 that I know that is very prevalent in Ireland and in the UK. Now for these, we have other alternatives and that's oligonucleotide therapies and descends oligonucleotides or small interferon RNAs. These genetic silencers were published again in the New England, the randomized control trials. And in this case, these trials were focused in polyneuropathy. The first of them, 
the Apollo study tested a, a small silencing RNA and it showed to decrease almost 90% the production of TTR. And the primary endpoint resulted positive. And as you can see here, the neurological symptoms got stabilized or even got a little bit improved in the patients who received patisiran during the 18 months of the trial as compared with those who received placebo, that the neurological symptoms continued to progress. Now we have data of the 24 months of open label trial. And we see that this compound has changed dramatically the natural history of the disease. And you, you can see here how the individuals who got into the placebo arm when they were transferred to receive the active compound, the stabilization that they get in the progression of the disease, while the ones who already received patisirand during the trial, they continue to do very well under continued treatment with the drug. But what about the heart? Do we have any hint about what happens at heart level with this drug? Well, there was a sub-analysis in the trial, in the Apollo study, that we were able to see what happened with the individuals who had a cardiac disease. And here it was defined as a left ventricular hypertrophy of 13 or more that could not be explained by any other finding. And that was almost 60% of individuals included in the trial. Well, with, when the cardiac parameters were analyzed, it was seen that individuals who received patisiran did much better. And you can see here, for example, results from mean left ventricular wall thickness. And you can see here that in such a small period of time, only 18 months, almost 30% of individuals who got into the trial got a higher than two millimeters decrease in baseline LV wall thinness, which is certainly significant. What about nt pro -BMP? You see again, 30% of them got a more than 30% and more than 300 milligrams per liter decrease in nt pro -BMP, as opposed to the ones who receive placebo, because in the group who received placebo, more than 50% of individuals increase nt pro -BMP during these 18 months. And analyzing global, global longitudinal strain, almost same findings. Really an improve because a 2% improvement in GLS is certainly significant in 20% of individuals. We don't have data from cardiac manifestations in the open label extension, except nt pro -BMP values. And as I can highlight here, because this has been recently published, the results go in the same direction. Stabilization of nt pro -BMP values in patients who already received patisiran during the trial, and in those who during the trial they receive placebo, which is the first column, you see that after 12 months of open level extension, the nt pro -BMP values got a little bit better. What about side effects? Well, the side effects of patisiran, you can see them here, is obviously infused related reactions because this drug is given once every three weeks IV and it has to be given with pretreatment with corticoids. The other trial is the NeuroTTR trial. This is another genetic silencing molecule which is given weekly subcutaneously. And in this case, it produces as well a good reduction in TTR levels, which is what we want, and also an improvement in the progression of the neurological symptoms. Also, we have data from the open label extension, and you can see here that the drug in the open label extension also alter the slope of the decline in the neurological symptoms. But what about cardiac parameters? Again, almost 60% of individuals included in the trial had left ventricular hypertrophy of 13 or more. 
And when these groups, this group of individuals were analyzed, the parameters, the same parameters, hypertrophy, GLS, um, and TPROBMP, in contrast to what happened in Apollo study here, we did not observe any preliminary data showing efficacy at cardiac level. The bad news about inotersin, which is this compound, which is much more easy to administer because it's subcutaneous and does not require, require pretreatment, is that patients, a, a, a large proportion of patients included in the trial, 54%, showed some decrease in platelets. And actually, this was important in one of the patients who got an intracranial bleeding and died. After that occurred, weekly platelet check was mandatory. And after doing that, no more cases of thrombocytopenia were found. But nevertheless, the subcutaneous administration, which was one of the advantage of this compound, was somehow lost by the fact that you have to check platelets every week in, the, in these patients. So at the end of the day, these are the, this is a, a table comparing patisiran and inotersen, and you can see here that, well, one is an IV drug given every three weeks, the other is subcutaneous every week, and does not require pretreatment, uh, pre but it has some important side effects like thrombocytopenia and renal events that make platelet monitorization required. But the good news is that we have a second generation of genetic silencers that probably will overcome these problems. And these second generation are currently being tested in randomized trials. And we have trials for polyneuropathy, which are the LEOS A and Neurotrust form. And in both cases, these trials will compare with the placebo arm of previous studies. And what is more interesting for all of us is the cardiomyopathy trials that are currently ongoing with either patisiran or with the new agents. These new agents have other uh, characteristics. They have the same molecules, but they are linked with a trivalent Galnac molecules. So by doing that, these residues favor the liver uptake of these drugs because the, this TTR, the TTR is produced mainly at liver. So by doing that, we have the opportunity to provide a ligand that is uptake very heavily at liver. And by that, we can deliver our drug to the correct drug, to the correct place. So the uptake at the hepatocytes is much higher and we can avoid systemic problems like the platelet problems that we were just talking about. We know all as well that these new drugs called butricidan and uh, LRX um, can be given subcutaneously once every three months or once every month. And obviously that is really good for the patients. And moreover, we are very lucky because very recently we had the results at nine months of the neurological trial with one of these agents, which is butricidan. And as you can see here, the butricidan met the primary and all secondary endpoints at nine months, even the reduction of anti pro -BMP with a very good safety profile. So very good news are expected from these drugs. We will need to wait to the 18 months, which is the, the, the time required for this trial, the LEOS A, but we are certainly ex looking forward to receive those results. And the last frontier is even here. We have uh, this was presented last year at the International Society of Amyloidosis meeting, which is CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in, T in a mice TTR model. And you can see here that this has moved very quickly to the clinical arena. And a phase one trial using this genome editing platform 
is already, already being conducted. And it dosed the first patient in November last year. So certainly by blocking the gene, we will be able to reduce or complete or, 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 or reduce almost completely the production of TTR. Nevertheless, we will still have some questions to answer. What is the role for combined treatment? Can we give removers? And as you can see here in the results of this patient, that patient that got reduced TTR deposition at heart level as assessed by stintigraphy, or this study from the London group, from the National Amyloid Center in London with very limited number of individuals, 16, that were treated with patisiran and by MRI, they check what was the evolution of extracellular volume in those patients and compare with 16 controls that had wild type or TTR, hereditary TTR amyloidosis and were not treated with patisiran. And as you can see here, it looks like very, that it's very interesting what you achieve in only one year of treatment. What is the last step? The last step that we can try to influence is remove, removal or elimination of deposits. And we are working on that. And there are three trials ongoing for that. One is using a molecule that is widely available, which is doxy, doxycycline plus TATCA. And this is being tested in a phase three trial ongoing in Italy with 102 patients. And results are expected in the second half of this year. We'll see what happened, but uh, and hopefully the COVID pandemic, we hope that has not influenced the results of this trial as the population included of patients in this trial were predominantly elderly men with wild type TTR amyloidosis. But we have also monoclonal antibodies being tested to promote removal, endogenous removal of the TTR fibrils. And for that, we had a trial that was completed early this year, early last year, which is the PRX004 with a phase one. Uh, this was a phase one trial for polyneuropathy in hereditary TTR with good preliminary results. And it seems that this is going to be moved into a phase two trials for cardiac disease. And the ongoing NY006 trial that started February last year, and we are currently recruiting the last cohort of five patients in this phase one trial. So we will have results of this trial by the end of this year, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to move this compound to next stages. So in conclusions, there are new alternatives to treat patients with TTR amyloidosis. We already have one of them that has been proven to be effective in wild type TTR and hereditary TTR patients with cardiac disease. We have another approach by using genetic silencers that have been proven to be effective in patients with hereditary TTR and neurological disease. And patisiran, unlike inotersen, also showed positive preliminary secondary effects at cardiac level that we need to confirm in the ongoing phase three cardiomyopathy trial. New treatments are certainly under development in this area. And now that we have been able to recognize that this is a much more frequent disease that we what, that we thought before. We will have an immense um, group of opportunities in upcoming years. Thank you very much for the for your attention and your invitation. Great, thank you so much. Another absolutely wonderful keynote lecture. It's, so exciting to see these evidence-based treatment options coming through and, and two fantastic lectures. So thank you. Thank you both of you so very much. So, so we